right, so looking at uh, the plan for Thursday, we're going to take a look at uh, two sections. Um, kind of looks here like we're skipping a section, but we did 17.5 on the first day. We did 17.1, 17.5. So now we're going from 17.4 up to 17.6 and uh, picking it up from there. Um, I did get around finally this morning to putting the answer key for the assignment for the textbook problems up on Canvas so you can check your answers as you do those problems. And after we go through today's lesson, you'll be able to tackle the majority of the problems in the homework assignment because there's a big section associated with 17.6. And to me, this is where the chapter gets uh, gets to the good stuff. This is the stuff that's kind of a practical application of uh, the thermal chemistry that we've been studying. So 17.6 looks something like this. And uh, we're going to be working the free energy equation today. So a lot of this data that I'll be using today or working with today is coming from that table. That table that comes from the appendix, we're going to use a lot of that data right here towards the beginning. So it starts like this. We're going to look at free energy and how it can be calculated for a chemical reaction. For chemical reactions, we are often interested in the standard free energy change, delta G, standard conditions. The energy change in free energy that will occur when the reactants in their standard states are converted to the products in their standard states. Standard states being one atmosphere, 25 degrees Celsius, um, molarity of one. Knowing the change in standard free, ener free energy uh, values for a reaction allows us to compare the relative tendency of these reactions to occur. In other words, will they occur? Will they be spontaneous or not spontaneous? Will there be free energy to spare? Is it at equilibrium? Um, all those kind of things. So there's a variety of different ways that free energy might be calculated. Um, so we're gonna look at three different methods. We'll do like two examples for each method, just to give you a feel for how those work. <coughs> They're all pretty straightforward and pretty uh, easy to work with. So one common method is to calculate the standard free energy using the Gibbs-Hemholtz equation, which we started looking at yesterday. But to solve for the first example, the decomposition of calcium sulfate, actually it's the dissociation of calcium sulfate is just dissolving. Um, in order to solve this problem based on the information I have, I would need to know what the delta H value is, and that's not given here. I would need to know what the delta S value is, that's not given here. I do know the temperature, so I got something to start with. I know what T is. But I'm going to have to figure out those other pieces before I can get to delta G. So that's where the table of thermal uh, thermochemical data is going to come in handy. Um, so for this one, for the delta H values, I can go to the thermochemical data table. I can look up the standard enthalpyl formation, the yeah, delta H for calcium sulfate, and I would get a negative 1431.1. For calcium, the ion, a negative 542.8. And for the sulfate, a negative 909.3. These are all in kilojoules per mole. So then what I would do, is I would do my, I'm not good at drawing epsilons, my uh, 
keto formation of the products minus the sum of the standard enthalpy of formation of the reactants. And I would just plug those numbers into that equation and figure out what my delta H is that way. So the products would be uh, negative 542.8 plus a negative 909.3 minus Obviously, those negative signs and the double negatives and things like that are those things you want to watch out for because that's where you can make simple mistakes that carry out through the rest of the problem. So all those big numbers added and subtracted turns out to give you just a meager 18 kilojoules for the delta H value. Which, by the way, in itself is telling you that that's an exothermic reaction. You know, that, that much heat is given off in this reaction. So that's what delta H would be. Then you could do something similar and take the standard enthalpy, standard entropy of the reaction. Again, going from the tables, I would look up the delta S values. Uh, those typically are positive. Oh, we're still in Christmas music. Uh, six, 106.7, usually positive values for compounds and elements. Sometimes your ions, however, will be negative values. 53.1 for the calcium and 20.1 for the sulfate ion. And again, I would do the same thing. Just trying to be thorough here, so I'm going to draw a little thing out. Epsilon, the standard entropy of the products minus the sum of the standard entropies of the reactions. So the same kind of thing. The uh, products. For negative 53.1, this is uh, in joules per Kelvin, plus 1.1 joules per Kelvin, minus the 106.7 joules per Kelvin, which that comes out to be a negative 140.6. Kelvin. And ultimately, we're going to run into an issue where the enthalpy is in kilojoules and the entropy is in joules. So at some point, one of those two has to be changed. You can make uh, the kilojoules into joules if you want. I'm going to make the uh, joules into kilojoules here just because uh, that's where I get it. So we will get um, a negative 0 0.1406 kilojoules per Kelvin. And that's just to make sure that the numbers in the equation work out well with each other. Kilojoules there. Kilojoules there. Last thing is now that I have the delta H, I got the delta S, and I know what the temperature is, I can just plug them into the Gibbs Helmholtz equation and come up with my final answer. We're in the home stretch at this point. In this case, it would be negative 18.0 kilojoules. Minus 
298, it's got to be in Kelvin. And a negative 0 0.1406 kilojoules. Kelvin will cancel out the Kelvin. That will leave you with kilojoules minus kilojoules. Or in this case, kilojoules. Plus kilojoules comes out to be a positive 23.9 joules of energy. Not particularly hard calculations, but um, it's kind of more about good bookkeeping than it is about high level math skills. Uh, so is this reaction spontaneous? The sign of delta G is going to tell us if it is or not. Is this spontaneous? No. Positive values are not spontaneous. This is the work you would have to put in, 23.9 kilojoules. You'd have to do that much work to make this reaction happen. This reaction is not spontaneous in the direction of the screen. Is uh, talking one molar solutions because we've got things going into solution at 25 degrees Celsius. It is not spontaneous for calcium sulfate to dissolve at those conditions. So, just a little further explanation of that. You know, we're looking at calcium sulfate dissolving completely to make calcium and sulfate ions. If you have one mole of this, you should get one mole of that and one mole of that. So it's telling us that calcium sulfate should not dissolve. Water to give one molar solution. And uh, I was curious because calcium sulfate is part of our chuchups and our chuchups nas. Um, I was looking to see what kind of solubility it actually has. Back solubility is only 0 0.02 per liter. So uh, it's not dissolving to an appreciable extent, at least not to that full extent that the equation would apply. Um, here's a little question that's going to come up from time to time. It's, it's, it's probably good that I start earlier than I usually do emphasizing this, but a common question to ask on a test or even a free response question, if either multiple choice or free response is something to the effect of, is this reaction entropy driven? or enthalpy driven. In other words, which one's making a bigger decision about the outcome of this reaction? Now this one's a little bit backwards because the reaction's not happening. So in, in, a, in a sense, which one's preventing this reaction from happening? Is it the enthalpy or the entropy? The entropy. We're trying to get a negative value for that reaction to happen. You know, that's what would make it happen. Um, delta H is cooperating. It's already a negative value. But it's the fact that we got a negative value here. 
and then it's multiplied by that multiplier of the temperature. This is what's making it that double negative. This is what's making it a positive. So it's the entropy part of this reaction that's preventing it from happening. It's easier to think of a reaction that does happen and like what is supporting this reaction <coughs> happening, but. So it's always just the one with like plus sign pretty much then? It's basically the one that, uh, no, because usually this is a reaction that's not happening. Yeah. So if it's something that's not happening, it's like what's giving it more of the plus sign. Okay. But if it's a reaction that is spontaneous, yeah. then you'd be looking for who's winning the battle, oh. making it negative. We'll, we'll address that with other ones as well. This is probably not the best example to start that line of thinking now that I think about it. Um, example number two, we're going to do something similar to this. We've got standard, uh, standard free energy change for this reaction. This time is at a much higher temperature of 500 Kelvin. Um, I can do this in a little less writing than I did previously. I'm going to look up the values for I'm going to do this for uh, copper. Delta H value is zero on an element. If you can't find it, delta H on the table for an element, it's because it's not there. Elements are zero for their enthalpy. Water in its gaseous state. Watch out for the state is a negative 241.8. Um, copper oxide, negative 157.3. And hydrogen in its naturally occurring state is also zero, which is why you can't find it on the table of standard enthalpy of formation. So, uh, I'm not going to write down the epsilon things there. We just know it's the products minus the reactants. So we'd have negative 157.3 plus zero minus a negative 241.8 plus zero. Now delta H would come up to be a positive 84.5 kilojoules of energy. So this is an endothermic reaction. Um, next, uh, S. Love it. Um, Thirty-three point two for this element. Water is 188.7 in the gaseous state, 42.6 from the table, and hydrogen is 130.6. Three, it's really bad. Three. And those are all in a uh, Joules per mole Kelvin. So I'd have 42.6, comes up to negative 48.7 Joules Kelvin. And one of these two has to be converted either to kilojoules or joules. I'm going to, again, take this one and just convert it to kilojoules right away. By themselves, they're both fine, but when you put them together, the next equation, so you got to be right. And then Gibbs Hemholtz it. So we would 
have the 84.5 kilojoules, 500 Kelvin. I'm going to make it three sig figs on the 500 Kelvin just because I feel like it. Negative 0. 0.487. And the kilojoules will add to the kilojoules, giving us a positive 108.9 kilojoules for that one. And you would say, again, that this reaction is not because of the delta G in a positive value. Again, you would have to put in that much energy in a form of work in order to make the reaction go forward. But it's not just going to happen on itself, by itself. So that's part of the reason why we got the tables. And you know, delta H and delta S, you handle those numbers the same way. But then when you get to the delta G, you're just plugging it into the uh, Gibbs. Helmholtz equation. There's a, another way of handling uh, Gibbs free energy. And this will also look familiar in some aspects because we're going to use Hess's law. The second method for calculating delta G free energy for a reaction takes advantage of the fact that enthalpy, like enthalpy, Free energy is a state function. Enthalpy, entropy, and free energy all are state functions, actually. Therefore, we can use procedures for finding delta G that are similar to those for finding delta H, as we did when we did Hess's law. So here's the idea behind that. Um, This reaction, the synthesis of carbon monoxide and oxygen gas to make carbon dioxide, is a reaction that we want to find out the delta G for. And that can be done by combining these two reactions. All we have to do is arrange these two reactions adjust their delta Gs accordingly, and then combine them to give us this uh, other reaction. So one of the things I'm looking at is um, reversing reactions, uh, doubling coefficients, having coefficients, tripling coefficients, whatever it is, to get everything to match up with the coefficients and the quantities that we have over here. So I begin by looking at something like carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide only occurs in one place in these two reactions. It's on the right side. I need it on the left side. So because it's on the right side, I'm going to reverse this reaction. And And then I'm just going to write it down here in its reversed form. That would be a two carbon monoxide and four water molecules. It's got the right coefficient. That's why I'm not doing anything else other than reversing it. I want two carbon monoxides. I got two carbon monoxides. They're just on the wrong side. So I'm just going to reverse it. Um, that gives me two CH4s, three O2s. And because I'm reversing it, we just reverse the sign on the delta G. Um, positive 1088. I look at the other reaction. Um, I see that I do want carbon dioxide on the product side, and this is the only place that carbon dioxide shows up. I need twice as much of it, though. I need two moles of CO2. So I'm going to end up doubling this one, not bubbling, doubling. So 
So everything will have a coefficient of two in front of that one. It will be two of the CH4s, four of the O2, two of the CO2, And that will be doubled from 801 to 1602, negative 1602. If I did that correctly, all the other stuff should cancel out, leaving me with just the equation that we have stated up here. So I've got four waters here. They cancel out with the four waters there. I've got... Uh, Four oxygens on this side, three oxygens on this side. I'll get rid of the three and I'll just reduce this down to one. And then I've got the methane, get rid of those, get rid of those. And then that's going to leave me with carbon monoxide, one oxygen, and the CO2. Delta G just being the sum of those two steps. Today. He's been tricking the system into trying to keep it normal by telling it that the outside temperature is 41 degrees, which has been fine until it gets down to 10 degrees, and then we don't get enough heat. Um, anyway, basically the identical solution style that we did when we did enthalpies delta H's with this stuff, but now we're doing it with delta G's. So familiar, but there is a, an interesting twist to this story with this Hess's law thing with example number four, um, kind of a practical application of this. Since free energy changes are additive, it is often possible to bring about a non-spontaneous reaction by coupling it with the reaction for which the delta G is a large negative number. So you can turn a, non, a non-spontaneous reaction into a spontaneous reaction by pairing it up or coupling it with a reaction that will make it spontaneous. And this is an example of that taking place. Consider the preparation of iron metal from hematite ore. Hematite ore is iron oxide. Iron oxide decomposing into iron metal and oxygen gas is very much not spontaneous. It doesn't want to happen on its own. It's clearly a non-spontaneous reaction. Even at temperatures as high as 2000 degrees Celsius, it doesn't want to decompose. Delta G is a positive quantity, and that's why we know it's not spontaneous. Suppose, though, that this reaction is coupled with a spontaneous oxidation of carbon monoxide. Um, that part of the reaction is spontaneous at 25 degrees Celsius. Now at a glance, it seems like this is not gonna fix that. But we look at the overall reaction, we can figure out what that's gonna be. So what we'll do is we will take the reaction that we have to begin with, And uh, I'm still going to have the iron oxide on the reactant side. And I'm still going to have the iron ore on the product side. And the coefficients are still right. So I'm not even going to rearrange the first reaction. But I am going to put this down here. Uh, 742.2 joules. Then what I'm going to do is take 
the carbon monoxide reaction. And uh, I'm gonna put, produce uh, three carbon dioxides instead of just the one carbon dioxide that this reaction is producing. So everything's gonna get multiplied by a factor of three. That would give me three COs. Um, half of an O2 multiplied by three would be three halves of an O2. And three CO2s. And now my delta G is gonna be three times negative 257.1. And that's where that energy is going to get ramped up. So now when I combine things, the oxygens cancel out the oxygens. Um, and everything else we basically want to keep. So we got the reaction. And now it goes to 29.1, both the negative sign and one. Reaction it is spontaneous. So apparently, coupling is a pretty important thing in chemistry. Although iron oxide does not spontaneously decompose. It can be converted to iron by the reaction with carbon monoxide. This is in fact the reaction used in the blast furnace where iron ore is reduced to iron. Many industrial processes involve coupled reactions. In fact, a lot of your biological reactions are coupled as well. Coupled reactions are common in human metabolism. Spontaneous processes such as the oxidation of glucose, which by the way, has lots and lots of extra free energy to do work in your body. That's why sugar is good. Allows, allows you to do a lot of work. It's used to bring about non-spontaneous reactions in the ADP ATP cycle, which by itself is not a spontaneous reaction. So lots of sugar lets you overcome lots of ADP ATP um, reactions. And uh, Obviously, that's what we need for our human metabolism. And there's many other biological reactions that also involve coupling. Method number three. Still trying to find out delta Gs, just finding another way of doing it. And this is um, often one of the easiest ways of doing it if the data is available for it. The third method of calculating free energy change for a reaction is using standard free energies of formation. The standard free energy of formation or delta G standard sub F of a substance is defined as the free energy change that accompanies the formation of one mole of that substance from its constituent elements with all the reactants and products in their standard states basically the same definition that we did for delta H when we figured out what standard free energy of formation was for delta H. <clears throat> Note that analysis an analogous to enthalpy of formation, standard free energy of formation of an element in its standard state is zero. When using this method, it is assumed that the reaction takes place at 25 degrees Celsius the problem with this method, even though it's the easiest method, is that this method does not allow for changes in temperature. So it can only tell you what the reaction is going to do at 25 degrees Celsius. So that might be the easiest way to do it, but it's the most limited set of conditions for solving it. And that's the drawback. Let's take methanol. Methanol is a high octane fuel used in high performance racing engines. We 
we want to calculate the standard free energy for the reaction using nothing but appendix four and the delta G values, which is in the center column on that table. Right, out of that table, methanol is negative 163 kilojoules per mole. Oxygen is zero because it's an element in its standard state. CO2 is a negative 394 kilojoules per mole. And water in gaseous state is negative 229 kilojoules per mole. So all that's from the appendix. So simply, I need delta G, standard conditions, and the uh, free energy of formation. I am going to I'm going to look at the coefficients. I'm going to do the products minus the reactants. So I've got two moles of carbon dioxide. I've got four moles of water. Subtract from that the sum of the reactants. That's uh, two moles of methanol. I think it's 163. Zero. <coughs> some of the products minus the reactants. That all comes out to a negative 1378 kilojoules. You see how all the moles cancel out um, for the delta G formation. I'm going to make a little note here. Large magnitude. Indicates this reaction very favorable. Remember, delta G is sometimes referred to as the driving force behind a reaction. So when you start getting really big values for your delta G and they're negative, you've got a strong driving force. That's a powerful forward moving reaction, which is what you want with your fuel. Because if your fuel doesn't give you a strong forward reaction, it sucks. Racing fuel's got some oomph to it, a lot of oomph behind that reaction. Of course, you want it to be spontaneous. So uh, a pretty easy technique, we've done this before with enthalpy and even entropy for that matter. Um, but that's what it is at 25 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere pressure and one molar concentrations and for any solutions that you have. <clears throat> I don't think we burn methanol in a racing car at room temperature. Something tells me it's gonna be a lot higher. So this is, you know, okay, yeah, this reaction's definitely got some oomph to it. And it probably has even more oomph at a higher temperature, I'm guessing. But uh, if I wanted to know what it was at a higher temperature, I would have to use the other techniques, probably method one that we were showing before. Method one allows you to adjust for temperature. Uh, so one more of these. 
and then uh, we can look at the next section. A chemical engineer wants to determine the feasibility of making ethanol by reacting the water with ethylene. That's an interesting concept. You're not old enough to buy alcohol, but you are old enough to buy ethylene. And I know where you can get some water. Just saying, this might, we might be onto something here. It tastes like crap because pure alcohol tastes awful. There's no flavor to it, it just burns. But still, you can dilute it. Mix it with the Kool-Aid, so to say. Anyway, let's see what this, uh, this reaction will do. Is it spontaneous? Um, 68 kilojoules per mole is that delta G of formation, negative 237 and negative 175. Delta G formation. Real easy in this one, products, negative 175. There's only one mole that I'm just gonna say, uh, I'm not gonna be even side. Minus uh, 68 plus the negative 237. Watch out for the double negative for the negative there. <coughs> the GF formation equals negative six. Kilojoules. So the reaction Imagine how awful that would taste. Alcohol is not the good part. It's all the sugar and other flavors that they mix into it that make it tolerable. Not that the effects of alcohol aren't the good part, but <laughs> as far as flavor, you want to enjoy getting that. Is supposed to be a dry January or what's it called? It's, it, yeah, but it, there's a January version of it now. Dry, going what is it? Dry January. Dry January? Yeah. Believe that. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to do it, but I find that when I'm grading papers, tests in particular, the only way to do it is drinking. <laughs> Getting warm in here? A little bit. It's a little warm in here. All right. All right. Not going to pass off from the heat. No. Cold. Um, you guys got seventeen seven, right? So this gets kind of interesting as well. I like this section too. I like all the sections after uh, section seventeen point three. The dependence on free energy. The dependence of free energy on pressure and also concentrations. All the free energy calculations up to this point have involved in some way, shape or form, standard free energy change for delta G. It is possible, however, to write a general relation for free energy change of delta G under any conditions where we can basically wait, take away the little uh, standard state symbol and just do for other conditions. And that involves a modification of the Gibbs. Well, it's not really even the Gibbs Helmholtz equation anymore. What we're going to do is take the uh, standard free energy, which we learn how to 
calculate with some of the previous uh, examples. And we're going to take that number and we're going to add a modifier to it that's going to adjust it for different temperatures and different concentrations. It brings out the quantity Q that appears in this equation. It's the reaction quotient that we got to know in chapter 13 and grew to love by chapter 15 and was your old friend by chapter 16. It has the same mathematical form as the equilibrium constant K. The difference is that the terms in Q, that appear in Q are arbitrary instantaneous pressures or concentrations rather than equilibrium values. So Q tells you your current set of conditions, whatever molarity you're at, whatever uh, partial pressure you're at, those are the numbers that go into Q. So that's the modifier that will bring this into alignment to give you the real conditions for your free energy. To use this general expression for delta G, you need to express temperature in Kelvin, we know that. We bring out the universal gas law constant again, because as you know, when, when in doubt, just throw the universal gas law constant in there and it will fix everything. Um, and that's gonna be in the units of joules per Kelvin. So we use the 8.31 version of that. Um, that's provided on the equation sheet. If you're working with joules, because you know sometimes you're working with uh, joules because of the entropies and stuff, you can use that version. If you wanna use the equation with kilojoules, you gotta make sure that you switch the decimal place over. So far as Q is concerned, the general rules for expressing the equilibrium constant are followed. Gases enter as their partial pressure. We gotta use the units of atmospheres. Species are in, aqu uh, in aqueous solution, enter in their molar concentrations. And pure liquids and solids do not appear, neither does the solvent in a dilute solution. So the same way you set up your equilibrium expression and your Q values in all the previous chapters, we're gonna do it the same way here. So let's take an example and start with figuring out what the Q would look like for this reaction. We're gonna consider the reaction where zinc reacts with a strong acid like hydrochloric acid. This is the net ionic equation. So they got rid of the spectator ion chlorine and we're just focusing on the ions that matter. We wanna write the Q for the reaction. Well, Q will be the products over the reactants. If it's in, aqueous form, it will be the concentration of the zinc ion. If it's a gas, it's gonna be the partial pressure of that gas. And for the reactants, the solid will not show up. So the aqueous hydrogen, will be in air, but don't forget, it's got a coefficient. And as you learn in chapter 16, those coefficients are something we have to pay attention to. It wasn't such a big deal when we were doing uh, acid stuff because those are always in a one-to-one -one ratio. But uh, as we were reminded in chapter 16, they're not always one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one ratios. So we also get to hear something that we haven't seen since chapter 13, which is a, um, I don't know, a mixed value for your Q where you have concentrations and partial pressures combined together. We threw that out there as something that could exist in chapter 13 and we never saw it again, but it actually does happen, especially when you're working with this stuff. Now we wanna calculate the delta G. I'm gonna calculate the delta G at standard conditions of 25 degrees Celsius. And uh, then we're gonna adjust it to non-standard conditions for part C down here. Now there's different ways that you can calculate your delta G at standard conditions. And what I'm gonna do is in one example, I'm gonna use one technique and the other example, I'm gonna use the other technique. I'm going to go with um, 
delta H. I'm going to use the uh, Gibbs Hemholtz equation for this one. This one's pretty easy to calculate for delta H because it is uh, standard conditions. Zero for this element, zero for this ion, a negative 153.9 for this one, and zero for this one. So uh, products minus reactants. That was easy to figure out. You can also solve for the delta S. That's going to take a little bit more work. This is 41.6. This one's zero. Negative 112.1 and 130.6. Delta S is standard conditions. So this would give us a negative 112.1 plus 130.6 minus 41.6 plus zero. Negative 23.1 joules Kelvin would also be equal to negative 0 0.0231 kilojoules Kelvin, if I'm going to align my units. And because those are all done at standard conditions and 25 degrees Celsius, then my delta G would be with those standard variables in place. This is going to come up to be negative 153.9 minus 298 Kelvin multiplied by the negative 0 0.0231. And that's all in kilojoules, so this comes out in kilojoules. So if everything was at one molar, 25 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere of pressure, well, then that would be my answer. I wouldn't have to do any more. But I want to find out what delta G is going to be at when I kept the temperature the same, so I'm not messing with everything, but when I change the pressure and I change the molarity of those pieces. By the way, you might be wondering, could I've used the delta G of the products minus the delta G of the reactants and got this number just using that? And the answer is yes. I'll do that in the next one. But this one, this part C doesn't give us any choices. Um, so now what I'm going to do is say delta G at not standard conditions is going to be negative 147. 0 0.0 kilojoules, which is the delta G at standard conditions, adjusted with that RT natural log of Q, where the R value is going to be 0 0.00831, because that's going to be in kilojoules and Kelvin. The temperature is 298 Kelvin. We're multiplying that by the natural log of Q, which is just going to take these concentrations and pressures and put them in for a Q value. But before I do that, I just got to make a little side note.
This uses um, atmospheres of pressure in the equation, and we're given the pressure in millimeters of mercury, which is not uncommon. It's a common unit for pressure, but we'd have to take the 750 millimeters of mercury. 760 millimeters to one atmosphere. We have to figure out that that is 0.986 ETM. Just to get everything in the right units. Now we can take our Q. We've got a 0.1 molar of the zinc. We got a 0.986 partial pressure of the uh, gas, hydrogen. And we have a 1.0 times 10 to the negative 4 squared. Don't forget the squared. Or the uh, hydrogen ion. But just like Good old Q and uh, K of yesteryear, you still don't have to worry about the units on those parts. This is just like an adjustment number that's going to fix everything. We'll put those numbers in. Delta G at non standard conditions comes out to be a negative 107.1 kilojoules of energy. So it is um, got less free energy at those conditions. Yep. But um, it is still a spontaneous reaction nonetheless. As the example illustrate, changes in pressure and or concentration can have a considerable effect on delta G. In this case, about 40 kilojoules of energy difference. Sometimes, when delta G is close to zero, just changing the pressure or concentration can change the direction of the spontaneity. Um, kind of teetering on the middle, you can push it one direction or another. And I think we'll see that a little bit in the upcoming examples, but we can often manipulate the reactants in the products and make the reactant shift. It's called the Chatelier's principle. <clears throat> so example number two. At 300 degrees Celsius, we've got this reaction. We know what the delta G is already for standard conditions of one atmosphere of pressure, one molar solutions, 25 degrees Celsius. So that's already calculated for us. That makes it easier and faster. The sign indicates that ammonium chloride will not decompose at 300 degrees Celsius to give, to give uh, ammonia and hydro hydrogen chloride gas, both being at standard pressures of one atmosphere. It's not saying it won't decompose. It just won't give you full one ATM of pressure when it decomposes. <clears throat> However, notice what happens when the partial pressures change, and these are lowered from one molar down to 0.1 ATM. We want to find the delta G at these lower pressures. So we're going from the standard to non-standard, and I'm gonna to have to use a Q for that. So I like to figure out what the Q is early on. Products over the reactants, give me the pressure of NH3 multiplied by the pressure of HCl. Those two are gases, they enter into the partial pressures. NH4Cl is a solid, it's not gonna be showing up. So that's what my Q value is gonna be all by itself. And then delta G, it's going to be the standard conditions which we're given. Plus the RT natural law of NH3 and HCl. So we 
just got to plug in our numbers. And that's pretty easy to do because again, delta G is already given and plus 13. We know the R constant, we know the temperature, and we got the concentrations of those two things right here. So delta G will be Uh, we're doing 300 degrees Celsius, so we got to convert to Kelvin. 573. Natural log. is spontaneous. So not spontaneous at the lower temperature of standard conditions, because that's what Delta is indicating here, but it is spontaneous at the lower pressures and uh, This shows that ammonia and HCl can be formed when each is at 0.1 atmospheres and heated to 300 Kelvin. Goes on to ask, does uh, Le Chatelier's principle support these findings? And if you think of Le Chatelier's principle in this case, if you lower the pressure of the products, the reaction is going to respond to fill in that missing void. The reaction would shift to the right to try to fill that void. And uh, if you shift the reaction to the right, well, that's making it more spontaneous. So uh, my answer to that was this. Yes, at standard pressures, the reaction was not going to be spontaneous in the forward direction. But by lowering the pressure of the product gases, the reaction will shift to the right to compensate for the lower product pressures. So say it, the Chatelier. You gotta acknowledge the man. You guys don't like to say it. You like to kind of say it, you know, well, I have guess say according to Le Chatelier's principle in there. Give the man props. Then they know you're thinking in the right mindset as a reading response. When did Le Chatelier figure out like, his principle? Um, I don't know. Goes back pretty far. I mean, when you think chemistry's only been around for 200 years. So. Yeah. The French were knocking out some, uh, you know, they had a uh, Chatelier, they had uh, what's his name? Uh, Lavoisier. Yeah. And they, they got fat and rich and they just stopped producing scientists. And the Germans took over. So we got one last problem to look at of a similar nature to this. Last example for the day. One method of synthesizing methanol involves the reaction of carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas. We want to calculate the non standard value for free energy at 25 degrees Celsius for this reaction when five atmospheres of hydrogen gas and three atmospheres. Five atmospheres of carbon monoxide gas and three atmospheres of hydrogen gas are converted to liquid methanol. 
So I'm going to use that equation that has the adjustment in there. The first thing I want to do is figure out what delta G is in its standard form, standard conditions. And that's where, in this case, it'd be really easy to use the delta G of the products minus delta G of the reactants. Um, I go to the table for that. This is negative 137, zero for hydrogen, negative 166. Zero delta G standard of formation. Plug into the equation. Uh, I'm just going to do this just, just for fun. You don't have to do it this way, but you could use the kilojoules because we did that in the previous ones, or you could put it into joules as long as your equations, the rest of your equation follows along. That's good. So now that we got that, we can start getting to our adjustment. Uh, I like to jot down what Q is before I get there. Because they always want to see what the Q is, nice and neatly labeled and set up. The hydrogen has a coefficient of two. Watch out for that. It's easy to forget the coefficients because we did a couple chapters where they didn't really affect us much. And now it On standard conditions, I'm going to take this T, L, N, Q, and plug in all the information that we have. Delta G will be um, a negative. Oh, I've got my negative sign over here. I lost it by mistake. There. Negative 2.9 times 10 to the fourth joules. Unless you want to use the kilojoules, use the kilojoules. Plus the R value. I'm just switching because I wanted to show you use this form of R as well. This is when you're using joules per Kelvin. Or put the decimal place and move it and do that thing. 298 Kelvin. Natural law of one over five. And 3.0 squared. That's the adjustment factor for non-standard conditions. So that would be one acceptable answer. It's nicer in kilojoules, but both of them are good. Either way, it's spontaneous reaction. I just switched around the constant in the units a little bit just to show you pay attention to that. But as long as you're paying attention to the units, you can make it work. So that opens up a big chunk of questions that you can do. Like in the assignment, it's the biggest line of questions. It's in the middle there. It opens up 45, 46, 49, 51, 55, 57A, 60, 63, and 67. Basically, the majority of the assignment now becomes available. And no, you don't want to do that yet. Save 73, 77, 79, and 83 for tomorrow. Because what we can do now that we know what Q is, imagine if Q is K, you could do equilibrium with free energy, which is what we'll do in the last section tomorrow. Oh. Last 
Great. Like, I'm like, oh, just 